Welcome to the Cultivation Cast by Black Dog LED with Kevin and Noah. In this podcast series, we will cover all things related to indoor cannabis cultivation. Welcome to the Cultivation Cast by Black Dog LED with Kevin and Noah. In this podcast, we cover all things related to indoor cannabis cultivation. We continue to receive feedback from our listeners and our viewers, and uh, we'd love to continue receiving that. So if you have ideas or questions, uh, concepts or ideas for future topics you'd like to see us cover, please let us know. You can do it through our site, our help desk, or the easiest might be just to email us at podcast at blackdogled.com. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at blackdogled.com. So let's dive right in today because we've got an interesting topic we've been looking to get to, and that's uh, something that's going to be near and dear to most of our customers, and that's you've got a garden you're trying to maintain. Most people aren't going to set up a garden just to grow a plant one time and then take it all down. You're going to have an ongoing garden. Not perpetual, that's a different topic, but let's talk about managing a garden and that if you have genetics you want to keep, if you want to maintain your garden, keep growing the same things, or if you have anything that you want to keep for any reason at all to give to friends or anything like that, we wanted to cover that sort of stuff. Also, you're going to have a flower area that you're going to need to feed. How do you properly feed your flower area from your veg area? And then the different concepts and everything that can go along with that. So that's what we're going to cover today is kind of managing your genetics or managing your garden or your your genetic library, if you want to call it that. So starting at the basics, right, Kevin, most people will have a flower area because that's why we're growing cannabis, at least most of us, not all of us. There are some other people experimenting with things, but most people are going to flower. So everyone thinks about a flower room. People call and ask us all the time, what do I need for my flower room? What do I need for this? And often in walking them through that, one of the questions that comes up is, are you maintaining a veg space? Where are you getting your plants from and that? So Everyone likes to talk about flour because that's where the money's made and that's where we get our cannabis from, our flour that we're going to consume. But we often don't talk about the veg side of things and why we keep genetics over there and how you keep genetics and how you get those genetics and how you get them from veg into flour and all that fun stuff. We always like to dive right into flour. So we'll spend a little time talking about that veg side. When it comes to genetics, why don't we start at the most basic? Because, you know, we'll talk about how to maintain clones and or mothers and that. But Let's talk about the two basic options everyone has in front of them. You can either go from seed or you can go from clone. What what do you see as the advantages or disadvantage of those? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you mentioned, you've only got two choices to to get plants. One is to get a piece of a plant, a cutting of a plant that uh, someone else started. And one is to start from seed. Uh, Seed has advantages for people that are in uh, states, for example, where clones are not readily available. Uh, But... The problem with seeds is you never know exactly what you're going to get. The state of uh, genetics of breeding in cannabis is still far behind, for example, what it is in tomatoes, where when you buy a packet of tomato seeds, you're pretty sure that every seed in that packet is going to give you a very similar plant that performs equally well or roughly equally well. Whereas in cannabis, most of the times we've tried starting from seed, we see vast differences in the individual plants that come up, not least of which is you always run the, the possibility, the uh, risk of getting male plants in there or hermaphrodites, even if you buy feminized seeds. The feminization process is not perfect. It just means that you get 90 or 95 percent females as opposed to only 50 percent. So you always run a risk of of ending up with a plant that you don't want, a male plant. Um, And then there's also the risk that uh, it's just not going to be the best performing plant. And we've done phonetics or uh, genetic hunts where we're planting 12 seeds out of a a packet so they're theoretically all the same and some of those plants perform a lot better than others and if you're only popping one or two seeds at a time or or four seeds at a time you really don't know whether you had the best of that particular strain or not. Um, In addition when you're starting from seed you have to wait for the plants to get sexually mature. It's not possible to do a sea of green style grow with starting from seeds every time because you can't start the plants off small enough. They have to get a certain age and a certain size before they reach sexual maturity. So there's a lot of disadvantages to seeds, uh, but there's a lot of advantages in terms of people being able to get them easier. And as well, you know, if you're looking for new genetics, that's probably one of the easiest ways to increase your genetic repository is go out and get some seeds. 
And of course, if you're dealing with autoflowers, you always have to start from seed. But if you start from clones, you're dealing with a known genetic. Hopefully the person that gave you the clone uh, would only have given you one off of a plant, which is uh, at least a higher end plant in terms of production and uh, vigor and is hopefully also fully female and not a hermaphrodite or a male. Um, and that automatically takes a lot of the frustration of, of starting stuff from seeds away because you know you've got a known female plant that's going to uh, perform better than average, at least out of a seed packet, because you're only going to save the ones that are actually better than average. And so that that's interesting. And, we, and you know, I think you've dealt with this as much as I have, and that you get on the phone and, and people are taken aback or surprised by the fact that, oh, if I get these seeds, these white widow seeds or this AK-47 or this super lemon haze or whatever they're growing, if I buy these seeds, right, they're going to be what I want them to be. And in fact, as you pointed out, that is not even close to the case in cannabis today. You're going to get a significant amount of variation in what you get out of it. And people just don't grasp that or or don't understand that fundamentally at the beginning. But as soon as we give them the example, say, look, if you have a brother or sister, you both came from the same parents just like all those seeds. However, you're generally going to be quite different than your brother and sister in some ways. You'll, you'll have similarities, as would all those seeds, but you're going to have variation in there, right? So that's that's something that they should all understand? Absolutely. And just as uh, siblings, some end up being taller than others. Same thing with the plants. Some end up uh, performing better than others. And often cases, you'll find that uh, you know one plant will produce a superior quality it might not necessarily be the most vigorous plant in there. Um, sometimes you'll find that one plant is vastly more vigorous than others, and, and hopefully every once in a while you get lucky and you find a plant that's not only incredibly vigorous but also produces the high-quality flowers. And that's something you want to hold on to because if, if you popped enough seeds to actually find that superior one, Um, people don't realize how long it takes. I mean, first of all, from seed to sexual maturity often takes six to eight weeks for a plant. So that would be the earliest that you could actually flip it into flower. And then you've got an eight to 10 week flowering period to figure out what it really is going to do. And so it's going to take you 18 weeks in a lot of cases to be able to figure out what you got from seed. Um, So if you have clones of that thing available, then it's easy to know right off the bat what you're going to get and not have to wait that 18 weeks to find out. So, and we always call it in the office, the genetic lottery, right? You're you're popping these seeds and you could end up with the greatest cannabis plant ever on the face of the earth. And you can also end up with something that's worthless and garbage. And that's the joys of popping seeds and going through a pheno hunt. And as you pointed out, the goal is to find those standout candidates, the ones that are outside of the norm that are even better than what you expected. And so, as you were saying, you end up with this. If you have that plant, whether you're coming from clone or you found it in seed and you've got this and now you can fill your room with this overperforming genetic and really hit um, either really amazing quality you're going for or amazing yields or if you as Kevin said if you found that perfect plant both amazing yields and quality uh, to go hand in hand there so that's a perfect segue into great so you've you're doing a pheno hunt as you said you pop 12 seeds you, you go through you run through that amazingly long um, process and just to point out to listeners is what you would do before you did that you'd, you'd grow them up to a point you could take a couple clones off you'd set those aside prop properly label them so you know which plant they belong to, then you're going to flower. And then you say, great, this one was the amazing one. These were the runts that didn't do well. You can go back, find those clones, throw them out or give them to someone who doesn't care about quality and be done with those plants. And now you've got the clones from these amazing plants. So that's kind of the goal, right, is to get through the pheno hunt and find your outliers, if you will, and, and keep those genetics going. So, right, that's the big argument for even thinking about maintaining genetics is now forever you have that amazing plant, right? Exactly. And once you identify that amazing plant, you want to hold on to it. And um, so one complication, though, if you are holding on to genetics in between runs so that you can run the same thing over and over again, it automatically requires that you have a separate vegetative area set up where you're always running 18 hours or more of light every day uh, because it's not possible to really keep plants happy uh, once they have flowered. It is possible to re-veg the plants and and try and get a clone off it. So let's say you were starting from seed. Um, We're not planning on saving and and doing cloning, um, but you end up with the best plant ever. 
um, and you recognize that only at the very end of flower. It is possible after flowering, if you harvest carefully and don't chop down too much of the plant, you can sometimes coax them back into revegetative growth. So if you put them back on a long day period, 18 hours a day of light, um, with a lot of nursing the plant back to health because you put it through a lot of stress, it essentially thought it was about to die and now you're bringing it back to life and trying to get it to uh, generate more clones for you. So that is possible. It's never ideal because it takes a very long time. It's an arduous process and it's not always perfect. Oftentimes you'll end up killing the plant if you're trying to reveg it after flowering. So that's where Noah was saying the best thing to do if you are planning on saving genetics when you're doing a phenotype hunt starting from seed, clone everything, label it before you flip into flower and then you will know halfway through or all the way through flower, which ones you can throw out and which ones you want to keep. And so that's interesting. If, if one of your major points said in that, and you went over quickly, but I do think it's important to point out is yes, because uh, I didn't say that early on, is if you're going to maintain veg and flower, no matter what, you do need two spaces ultimately. And some of our listeners don't always understand that. And that's not driven by the plants get angry at each other if one's in flower and one's in veg, but because you literally can't because they're daylight sensitive plants, we, we need different light cycles to maintain those two different environments. So it's it's not necessarily temperature, humidity, and it's not that the plants don't want to be near each other. It's that we have to isolate the lighting cycle. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, theoretically, you could run all of your plants in one room, have lights on 18 hours a day, and cover your flowering plants after they've had 12 hours of light. You cover them with a black plastic bag that doesn't let any light through and um, theoretically you could run that way um, is that at all practical or, or realistic no not at all it's not really possible in the real world to uh, maintain your plants in the same room in a veg and flowering state simultaneously it's about as realistic as those I've heard the growers say oh I'll just I don't need timer I'll just turn my lights on and off to hit the right flowering cycle and I've never actually seen somebody make it through flower doing that properly. It's uh, make, make your life easier there. Um, so, okay, so we have now clones. We've taken clones. We found our genetics. So you've, you've, you've found your winners, your, your stars, your rock stars. You've thrown away all the runs and all the ones that don't produce what you want or in the way you want. Or, and, and there are other things we haven't really, you know, Kevin touched on them earlier, other reasons you might select a plant. It could be, like he said, the speed in which it grows the vigor. Another thing is, if you're going to be cloning this plant, the ease with which it clones. As as Kevin will tell you, some plants can clone incredibly easily and some are take a little more expertise and a little more patience to clone. Is that true? Like, to, yeah, some definitely display more vigor in the rooting process during cloning. Um, some plants object very much to cloning and um, it's a near-death experience for them. They'll lose a lot of their leaves during the process and other plants send out roots amazingly quickly and continue growing even while they're um, trying to be cloned, which can actually be a problem if they're too vigorous at doing that. But uh, there's definitely ease of, of maintenance is another issue that you would want to consider when selecting your best genetics. So um, and, and someday, and I think we've gone over it and we'll, do, we'll continue to revisit it, is how do you clone and how do you maintain that environment and proper? Well, that's a different topic. So we don't want to shy away from that, but that's separate from this discussion. So with regard to that, if we're looking at these clones and we're saying, how do you select your winners? So we're going to go into what you do once you have them, but let's spend another moment on that. So for a winner, just to recap, something that you would look at to help you select your genetics when you're doing this hunt for the right genetic is, as Kevin said, as how, how vigorously does it uh, grow? How easy is it to clone? Is it How quickly is it going to send out roots? Of course, the, the obvious, which is how well does it yield and what's the quality of cannabis it's going to put out? But you might go even further in some other things like how well does it break? Branch. So we're really big on topping and getting a lot of good tops and getting proper branching. Some plants lend themselves to that better. Some are going to branch a little better and some you have to really fight against to get the proper branching. So there are a lot of different things you can look at. And just because we don't name it here, you might find a um, an aspect of the plant that's important to you that you want to breed towards, for lack of better words, even though you're not breeding really, you're, you're, you're hunting for a phenotype breeding would involve crossing plants. But in terms of finding your proper or plant for your garden, you don't have to listen to us. You might find qualities that are important to you and you can go out and pheno hunt for those as well and try and isolate those and fill your garden with that desirable trait that you're looking for. Um, so, so now we've selected these winners, Kevin. So now what do we do? We've got, we've got this set up and now we've got options. So now we've decided I maybe went from seed 
I, I did my pheno hunt and I found my clones or I, I took plants, flowered them and picked out the clones based on what performed well. Or I went to my local shop or a friend and I grabbed some clones. But either way, I've got plants I want to maintain. Now, there's different ways to maintain those. Now, again, like we identified, you need to have a veg and a flower if you're going to maintain genetics. We've already established that. But there are different ways to take the clones and, and, and let's lay out a couple of simple terms. Everyone's heard of the term mother. So you can have a mother you're going to pull clones from. Or there's another method, and we're going to call it for the sake of this discussion, inline cloning. So I'm going to take clones from something that I'm going to then put into flower versus a mother that's going to stay there and continue to clone out for me. Kevin, why don't you explain a little bit about what those two are and, and how they look and how they're different and maybe some advantages of those. Yeah, and, and it's not a black and white absolute thing. There's uh, varying degrees with which those concepts can overlap. But with a mother plant, generally what people mean is that they are keeping a plant in a vegetative growth stage purely for the purposes of being able to cut clones off of it on a regular basis. Uh, for home growers that are only running one flower uh, tent or one small room, a mother plant is uh, a good way if you've got four or five different genetics that you want to keep around and you're only going to be flowering one of them at a time, you will essentially end up with a mother plant. You have to have a uh, instance of that plant to that particular genetic in vegetative growth and keep it in vegetative growth until you're actually ready to take clones off of it and flower. So if you are maintaining a, a repository of genetics, chances are for a smaller scale operation, you're going to end up needing to have mother plants. And, and the mother plants may not actually get clones taken off them, um, except once or twice a year, but they exist simply as a repository, as a an instance of that genetic strain that you can uh, take from any time. Now with inline cloning, the idea is you are vegetatively growing plants, getting them up to size and getting them ready to flower, and then just before uh, you actually put them into flower, you can take clones off of them, and oftentimes as you're vegging plants up, you end up, especially if you're doing a lot of topping and keeping the plants nice and bushy, you end up with little branches, little suckers at the base of the plant or in the middle of the plant, which aren't really going to be very healthy in terms of their flower potential because they're a little bit too squeezed in. But it turns out that those suckers are actually usually the best ones to clone from. They're very anxious to grow. They're um, anxious to root, and they already had kind of a bad lot in life to begin with in the plant because they were hiding under everything else. And as soon as you take them off and put them in a clone dome and get them going, they actually tend to clone pretty easily and pretty quickly. So it's an ideal way of taking your clones. Um, the problem is, of course, that you have only in a couple of weeks, for example, to ensure that you've actually successfully cloned that plant. Um, and so you have to either be certain of your cloning skills and your abilities in doing that, uh, because if you do flip the plant into flower before you knew that the clones you took off of it were actually rooted, there's a small possibility if all your clones fail that you've lost that genetic or you'd have to re-veg that plant after it's done flowering. So there is some risk involved, but it's something that um, is also a, a scale issue. If you've got a massive commercial operation, does it make sense to have a giant mother plant that you can take 200 clones off of every time? Or if you've got 200 veg plants ready to go and you're just taking one clone off of each of them, in a sense, in essence rather, to replace them, their individual population in your veg rooms, and that actually can work very well. You no longer need to have a separate mother room, a separate mother area. And of course, there are potential disadvantages to having a mother around as well, because if you've only got one plant of a genetic and it happens to get a virus, then you're out of luck. So having multiple mother plants through this inline cloning method can actually help spread your risk around and eliminate some of that as a potential uh, downfall. And so um, one thing I've noticed being around different gardens over time is that often if you have a problem with bugs or a disease or a mold or mildew, they're going to always go to the weakest plant um, as the vector for that. And I've seen at least anecdotally that I feel those older plants, I don't know if it's out of just neglect because people don't care as much about the mothers because they're more focused on the, the actual production, the flower, or maybe plants that are in veg and going into flower, but they tend to be a problem spot from what 
I've seen. And so, again, it might just be neglect. But I, I think the pulling off of existing genetics, the inline cloning method, is nice. But as Kevin pointed out, it really only works for a fast-moving production environment where you always have things that are moving through veg, moving through different stages. And that versus a home grow where you're going to flower for three months, then change to another genetic, then flower. And you might only flower an individual genetic once a year. Exactly. Now, uh, there's definite advantages to the inline cloning method um, if you're a large scale operation, uh, but it also is somewhat dependent on exactly what your growing method is. Because, for example, if you are running a sieve green where you're flipping clones that just got rooted into flower, then inline cloning isn't going to work very well for you there unless you let the clones get grow up to be uh, twice the size that they need to be and then chop the tops off and then flip those into flower. But um, for most sea of green type operations, you would want a giant mother plant that you can be taking 200 clones off of every few weeks uh, to do that. So the inline cloning method works if you're growing larger vegetative plants and flowering those, but it doesn't work so well for the sea of green. Yeah, so there's a lot of exceptions to these, and and please do keep in mind what we're talking about today. There are very few absolutes. There there are, are so many different variations on what we're talking about today. We're just trying to give a quick intro, but uh, again, we've seen every kind of in between method you can imagine, and, and all kinds of different variations I couldn't even come up with. And one of the things we hear about all the time, there's a lot of rumors out there, things about genetic drift and and mothers going bad over time, and your genetics going downhill over time, and there's a lot of misconceptions out there over it. Um, unfortunately, of course, people tend to uh, relay stories which have negative outcomes to them as warnings to others. And so, for example, if you're doing the inline cloning all the time, but you're only taking clones off of one of your particular veg plants, if that particular veg plant happened to get catch a virus just before you cloned it, then all of your clones for the next generation are going to have that virus. People also don't realize that uh, genetic mutations are happening all the time as the plants grow. They actually did a study a few years ago where they looked at uh, the genome of a particular cottonwood tree up in Wyoming. Uh, cottonwood trees are the state tree of Wyoming, for those who didn't know. Um, and cottonwood trees grow very large. They grow very quickly. They did a genetic study looking at various different branches on this tree. So it's one tree that came up from a seed theoretically one genetic individual, but they found genetic differences between every branch they looked at on the tree. And it's because every time those cells are dividing to create a new uh, growth point, uh, to create a new leaf, to create a new stem, whatever, the cells are dividing and there are errors made in the genetic copy. Most of the time, those errors don't actually mean anything. There's a lot of junk DNA in everyone's or in everyone's genome. So oftentimes you can make mistakes in copying and it doesn't really make any difference whatsoever. The cell is going to continue behaving exactly as its parent cell did. However, every once in a while, one of those genetic uh, mistakes will end up causing that branch or anything that's continuing to grow from that point on and all of the, the daughter cells of that one mutated cell to behave differently. Sometimes that's for the better and sometimes it's for the worse. And so when people are maintaining genetics, we've heard of people that have been holding on to genetics for decades where they're just continuously cloning off of it and then they'll notice that over time the plant isn't as vigorous as it used to be. And it's entirely possible that that's because they didn't win the genetic lottery. When they were cloning stuff, they happened to get a mutation that was detrimental to the plant and that's what they ended up cloning. And those can accumulate over time. Now you have equally good uh, possibility though of getting a genetic mutation which is actually beneficial, that will actually make the plant better than it was before. So it's not necessarily that uh, you get genetic drift or things inherently going downhill over time, but sometimes you can actually get things better. So if you can do the inline cloning on a large enough scale, if you've got a big operation and you can keep track of exactly which plants came off or which clones came off of exactly which plants, and at the end of flowering those plants, you evaluate every single plant, figure out which one was the best yielding one, and then preferentially continue cloning the plants that came off of that one 
particular individual, in theory, you can be picking out, weeding out all of the negative genetic mutations that might be causing the, the strain to go downhill over time and theoretically making it better over time. Unfortunately, though, it requires a lot of tracking, a lot of detailed tracking, because you've got to account for every individual plant as an individual and keep track of its progeny, what you cloned off of it. Um, and of course, it only really works in a, a larger scale. If you're doing this with two plants every time, I mean, it, it's still beneficial, but it's not going to be as beneficial as uh, when you're throwing the dice 50 or 100 times with 100 plants in a particular flower room. And that's just getting back to the whole purpose for doing all this to begin with is to find those best plants. And you're talking about kind of the more refined and advanced part of that where now you've already found your best plant, but now every time I'm cloning it, I have an opportunity to sort of find even a better plant inside of those clones and, and that subset, if you will. So it's really the same concept just taken to its, you know, it's, it's further a further end point, if you will, in terms of, of ref refining it. Exactly. But I've heard people justify keeping mother plants around because they they want to avoid this perceived genetic drop off over time. And it's just as likely to happen within branches on your mother plant as it is in entire large plants over time. So it doesn't make any difference in terms of managing your genetics for the long term, whether you're in uh, using a mother or doing inline cloning. But if you're doing the inline cloning and keeping track of exactly what those plants yield when they're done flowering, then in theory, you have a chance to um, correct that over time. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, if, if you really think about it, it's, it, a lot of people think once they found their genetics, they're done. But really, if you look at it that way and you have the opportunity to do that kind of calling and, and searching, you can constantly be improving your genetic bank, even if you're not bringing in new genetics, which is not, not too many people are really talking about that at this point, and but we've seen it for sure. Absolutely. And as the um, industry is actually getting more research being done on it. They're finding all sorts of things which are infecting uh, cannabis plants. There's uh, a plasmid, which is a, it's almost like a virus, except it's essentially a naked virus. It's just a little bit of DNA um, that happened to come over from hops plants. And hops are the closest genetic relative to cannabis. And um, of course, hops have been grown commercially for a very long time and had a lot of research put into them. So they've done a lot of uh, scientific examination of hops. And they're starting to find now when they look at cannabis that a lot of the same things that can infect hops and cause problems in hops crops can actually do the same thing for cannabis. And so uh, there's a bunch of viruses out there. There's a bunch of these little plasmids, things that uh, aren't technically even viruses. Uh, but if you've got inline cloning and, and some of your plants happen to get infected with that and others don't, then that's one way that you can ensure everything doesn't get infected. Because if you do have a mother plant and it gets infected with a virus, then everything you take off of that mother plant is forever going to have that virus in it. Yeah. Yeah. And at that point, as far as having one point, one place where you're getting all your genetics, you know, and the, we both come from, from the tech sector. And, and if you've been in technology, you know, the old adage is if your data doesn't exist in more than one place, it doesn't actually exist because it could be lost at any moment in time. And so uh, I'd say coming over to the plant world, I definitely look at the genetics the same way as data. You know, you want to have a bank as we're talking about. It's also nice, just like with data, having an offsite backup. So if your place burns down, you know, these some of these genetics are really Literally, almost literally worth their weight in gold. So having backups offsite is also a nice thing so that you have that. But then as Kevin pointed out, you have one point, if something happens to that plant, it gets a, a weird virus or anything, you're going to move it forward with everything versus where you're pulling from multiple different plants and you're kind of spreading that risk out a little bit more. So definitely something to consider. And, and obviously, as he's pointed out multiple times, the considerations and how you address those risks are different for a home grower versus a commercial, not because you grow differently, but because your work, th your work through, sorry, let me say your throughput is completely different. And so you have to address things differently. Obviously, ultimately, you're going to use the same light and this, that, the other. So those are all interesting uh, topics and interesting concepts. And one thing we want to double back to before we wrap up is um, where you're getting this stuff. So, you know, we see, People talk about sleeping around. As, as they say in a garden, you don't want to sleep around. Bringing genetics into your garden is always a risky venture. And so we can't stress enough, if you have some great genetics you've found over the years and you've got your veg, 
keep in mind that's incredibly valuable to you and bringing in another plant into your veg is bringing a new partner into your relationship right like there's a chance you're going to screw stuff up do not do that without thinking it through preferably quarantining those plants before you get them in there certainly inspecting them closely before you put them in there but in terms of getting your genetics whether you're getting seeds or getting clones get them from a reputable trustworthy source whether it's your friend that you trust you've seen their garden you know they have good practices or it's a clone shop where you've had friends buy plants from there you know they're not necessarily carrying bugs seeds there's a little bit less risk there but i've i've, I've heard from kevin you can have things living on the outside of a seed and you can certainly have problems in the viruses seed. in the seeds actually can be a problem and, and not to mention there are systemic things, chemicals people put in their plants that we wouldn't want to smoke, and those can get passed through even the seed, and certainly through the clones. So it's not just pests and diseases, excuse me, not pests and disease only we're worried about, but again, you're going to grow this up flower and smoke it or consume it yourself. You want to know that they didn't put a systemic in there, that you're not going to now go smoke your plant and have something in there you potentially don't want. So please do get your clones and seeds from a trustworthy source. Uh, it'll save you and could help you from a health standpoint, and it could keep your garden healthier as well if you focus on that so just something to think about there and last but not least but okay. that is another reason why it is actually useful to maintain your own genetic repository and make your own clones because if you're doing it you know exactly what the plants were uh, going through and what they've been treated with when you're cloning them yeah and as desirable as it is as you find these clones just like any bank you have to call the herd sometimes and you're going to find oh this plant's amazing i want to keep it. and then this plant next thing you know you turn around and your veg garden is full of mothers you don't even have room to take clones anymore so just get used to the fact of yes it's fun to find these but eventually you do need to keep your herd strong and keep calling it so you you should pull out genetics that you're not going to grow because if you overcrowd you're inviting more disease into your garden you want to have a nice healthy airflow in there so don't get carried away it's easy trust me we all love these plants and it's very easy to get caught up and and end up with way more genetics than you set out to start with and once you find a plant it is hard to let it go but don't be afraid to let it go you're just making room for the next genetic and next plant you can bring into your garden which as we always say could be the next greatest plant on the face of the earth you never know what you're going to get so uh, those are things to keep in mind and last but not least stay legal you know get your stuff from a, an appropriate source uh, promote legal operation in our in, in the cannabis world and and again, if you get out of control, your plant count could go beyond your legal limits. So keep an eye on that as well. Another reason to keep your genetic bank in check. But uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for another great uh, podcast here. We, we enjoyed talking to you. And please keep those ideas and concepts coming so we can bring you the best ideas and the best topics that you're interested in, not just what we want to sit here and talk about. So again, thanks for joining us. If you want to reach out to us with those ideas, again, podcast at Black Dog LED. Have a wonderful day and happy gardening. Mm-hmm.